satisfactory walk. Dreams a dream by the old canal. I shot my wand on sunny winds. Dirty old town. It's a dirty old town. All my balls not been washed, eaten hard on a lovely beach, suck a fuck and eat my butt, dirty old town, it's a dirty old town. And now I'll send out a text from Twitter saying that I'm streaming on here, typing out on the internet, dirty old town, dirty old town. Clicking on a little button so I can post myself online waiting for some folks to show up now. Dirty old town, dirty old town. Okay, hi folks. Is that, can you hear me? It might be a little tinny or compressed, as people like to say. I still don't know what that means, but apparently last time it was compressed. I still don't have a... I'm, I'm, I'm now streaming on the laptop, but I do not have a dedicated microphone yet. My apologies. Hopefully you can hear me. So today we're mostly going to talk about just one chapter from... Eric Foner's Reconstruction, Chapter 8, because we had uh, some technical issues last time. We're only going to do one chapter today. Chapter 8, which is about the consolidation of uh, Republican power in the Southern Reconstruction states post-14th Amendment, and uh, what, the, what they did, what, what their uh, political and economic agenda ended up looking like. Uh, what does he call it? The chapter is titled Pol uh, Reconstruction Political and, or no, I'm sorry. Yes, Reconstruction Political and Economic. So we're talking about how uh, the political coalition, the power that Republic, the Republican Party was able to exercise in the South, exercise that power. How it tried to change the culture of the uh, newly emancipated South, and how to change its political economy. So, the governments that took power in the South, the Reconstruction governments, were largely dominated politically by moderates, which is what you would expect, because those are the people who are closest to power, people with money, tend to be moderate. People who have access to networks of capital and influence tend to be moderate, not radical. Uh, and so you had amongst these people uh, carpetbaggers who'd come to the South to speculate and make money in politics or in the market. You had uh, hustling urban Southerners who were not part of the old planter class and some wealthy free blacks who were also already part of uh, some sort of power structure before the war. They take power in these political parties due to their proximity to power uh, pre-existing because that's the reality of uh, power. It, it, it draws, it uh, concentrates at poles and you have to have a certain relationship to power in order to be able to exercise it. It's one of the fundamental contradictions of democratic governance in, in a in a exploitative economic structure, the exploited are by definition 
kept from real meaningful uh, positions of influence, except for their labor power, which can only be coordinated in its use. Their individual influence is minimal. That's why they're being subject. That's why they're not in charge. Uh, so anyway, these moderate Southern Republicans carry, go into power with an idea that they're going to secure their they're going to secure their power in the South. This new Republican Party that is in, in, a, in a South that had been totally dominated by the Democrats since the days of Jackson. Uh, we're going to do it by bringing in capital investment from the North. Uh, and also by reaching out to the uh, the common white Southerner who was mostly who were va uh, largely uh, Democrats, so that project of reaching out to white Democrats politically while trying to reach up to Northern capital uh, economically fail in both efforts, and in fact the failure of one. The failure of one uh, necessitates the failure of the other, but in this case, I would argue that it was the it was the seeking of northern capital that doomed the project of expanding the electoral uh, appeal of the Republican Party, which we will get into. So. Like, for example, in Georgia, the moderate Republicans decided not even to seat the black, legislator, black legislators who had been uh, elected because the, the Constitution didn't, or their uh, state Constitution didn't provide for it. And they went, and they went with that, even uh, the demand of Democrats to try to appeal to uh, them. Didn't get any of them, just alienated uh, the former slaves. Uh, but the real thing that undermined the effectiveness of these Reconstruction governments was the quick emergence of factionalism within the Republican parties. And they were not necessarily around race or ideology that, form, that formed, it wasn't race or ideology that formed these conflicts so much as it was spoils, the spoils of political patronage. Because due to the economic isolation of, uh, of Republicans, black and white, in the offices, in, in public offices, both appointed and elected. Uh, the necessity to secure a living through politics becomes much more powerful than it would be in, uh, among a people who could, if they wanted to, get other work. By working in the Reconstruction government, both white and black politicians had essentially burned their bridges with the merchant community, with, with uh, respectable uh, white economic structure. They were essentially uh, uh, banned from intercourse with the, with the economy. So they had to secure themselves and their families through politics. And that, that went for white uh, and black Republican legislators and officials. And so there is this mad scramble for patronage. And it revolves generally, like I said, around, not around uh, ideology, but around either federal or state uh, jobs. So essentially you would see conflicts between political organizations led by a Republican governor fighting the political machine of a state's senator. Because these are separate pots of money and these are separate uh, job groupings and separate connections of, uh, of uh, vassalage. And so they create separate structures. And they have at their top, for the most part, white people, but they also uh, have uh, at their base uh, black participation, both with votes and then also with the lower level jobs within the structure. And you see uh, the emergence of black uh, uh, political organization around like churches in the rural areas, and community organizations that hooks into these patriarchy networks, but their power within these structures is undermined by their lack of uh, capital because they have been dispossessed of the land that they had been exploited for their labor and were now dispossessed of the ability to, to make a living. They were put out onto the market, but it turns out that if you don't have capital built in, 
And we mostly have, in, 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 a, in a putative democracy, there is a social capital that adheres to everyone regardless of their actual capital. But slaves are, ex-slaves are coming into a world as citizens without anything. And at that point, even though the, the, the liberal ideology of the time insisted, no, no one can get anything for anything. Everyone has to work through. That was, of course, all premised on the fact that everybody was basically taking what they wanted from the, uh, the world, from the, from the, uh, the bounty of the uh, expropriated Native American held land of the South, of the, of the, of the American continent. Now there's no land to give to these people because, of course, they didn't earn it. And so there is, they are at a, at a, in a condition more abject than an American citizen is supposed to be, which means they need market intervention that is not supposed to happen in a democracy. There was a way to alleviate that, and that is, of course, land redistribution, but that went against the interests of uh, capital and also the ideological infrastructure of liberalism that dominated uh, capitalism's uh, regime. So even while this fighting is happening and this corruption is, is, is getting endemic uh, and these machines are starting to fight, they are actually passing legislation. Uh, and uh, they are creating for the first time in the South an infrastructure of like a modern, modern welfare state. They're building the first schools and hospitals and asylums and, and the first sanitation uh, structures, uh, the first penitentiaries. Uh, and this is, you know, providing a new dimension of government uh, intervention in the economy, uh, at least as they, it was understood at the time. This is a new a step forward, a qualitative step forward in the, in, the, in the humanity of the relationship between government and citizen. Uh, because the, the, the condition of the ex-slaves undermines the, the liberal fantasy of what a state is. The idea that it's just something there to structure private inter, inter, intercourse and to provide some sort of framework for people to work things out themselves uh, is undergirded by a fundamental assumption of subsistence, of land access, that there was none of that for the former slaves. And that contradiction had to be resolved. Now, of course, one way to resolve it would have been to make them into landowners, but that would have conflicted with the existing nostrums around private property that had solidified. And also the interests of uh, finance that wanted to see the southern plantation economy brought back on its feet as soon as possible. Uh, but in the absence of land redistribution, what was necessitated by this new contradiction being exposed is an expansion of government's prerogative, which is what they did. Uh, and this did contribute to the well-being of... Uh, of people in the South in a way that had never been there before. Education for poor black and white students for the first time. Uh, and one, I believe a, a Louisiana legislature, I think it was, uh, said, had a line that uh, I thought was very uh, apropos that Foner quotes, uh, speaking of the former slaves, they look to the law because in the very nature of things, they can't look nowhere, they can look nowhere else. They can't uh, they look to the law because in the very nature of things, they can look nowhere else. As in, there is no land for them to fall back on, to try to exist outside of a social structure and a wage relationship. They are forced into social intercourse with all uh, local uh, systems arrayed against them by racial classification and by their status as uncapitalized. And it's only the law that can protect them. So there's four things that Foner points out that dominate the agenda of these reconstruction governments. Structuring an education system, uh, regulating race relationships, regulating labor relationships, and pursuing economic development. So when it comes to education, for the most part, the reconstruction governments were sort of happy to allow for segregated education to be enforced as a path of least resistance to public provision, because this was this was going to be the first time many of these states had any public education. A lot of people were able, even the ex-slaves said, "Fine, whatever. Let's just get some education." Especially since 
black only schools were more likely to be influenced, uh, uh, were more likely to hire black teachers and to be responsive to the concerns of black parents. So there, there was a, a willingness to go with that. Although there was some, where there was a concentrated black power, either in the form of black wealth in New Orleans, where they were able to integrate a school system uh, that persisted even in the face of white flight to private academies, uh, which uh, after a few years was reversed and, and black white students returned to integrated public schooling, uh, or in South Carolina, which was, as it was the most radical uh, uh, conservative reactionary state in the lead up to the Civil War and was the state where uh, secession began because it was the most thoroughly planterized country, uh, state. The largest percentage of the population was black. Planters had the, lar the most uh, hegemonic control of the political institutions and the culture. Now, because of that, the fact that so many uh, of the citizens in South Carolina were black and, and black enfranchisement was the law. South Carolina is one of the most radical reconstruction states for the same reason, or it is the most radical reconstruction state. And when they attempted to uh, integrate the University of South Carolina, uh, and there was a mass walkout of white students and uh, faculty, they brought in uh, Northern faculty, they abolished uh, tuition, they uh, created preparatory classes to help people get to the minimum standard, and created a integrated uh, public in, uh, institution of education. Um, in, and when it came to the question of race relations in the public, uh, which was the second area that they, uh, that they had to address, uh, there was a, a, a significant and successful drive to maintain or impose integration of public accommodations in the form of things like streetcars. Uh, beyond that, there was no real effort to, uh, to enforce an uh, integrationist agenda, once again, as a path of least resistance. Uh, on the question of labor relationships, uh, the, these Reconstruction governments went made it their uh, business. They were very insistent upon reordering the uh, negotiating position in favor of agricultural laborers who could, uh, so that they could dictate the terms of their own labor in the face of the presidential reconstruction era when it was an attempt, which was an attempt by the planters to use, essentially to take private regimes of slave compulsion and make them public. Uh, instead of that, uh, Reconstruction governments uh, outlawed ma uh, corporal punishment, narrowed notions, narrowed the vacancy laws to reduce the number of people who could be arrested just for not being employed, um, resisted demands by planned owners to enclose uh, land from foraging of uh, uh, livestock, uh, prioritized the worker's claim on the crop uh, of a given. Uh, plantation ahead of any debtors or debt holders who might be owed money by the planter so that you wouldn't have a situation which often happened where it is a uh, a uh, a debt drowning planter will get a uh, raise of raise a crop out of the field on the promise that he's going to split it with uh, his workers then uh, his creditors will come in and take the majority or even all of the profit giving them, the, the workers, no wage for having labored. Uh, and they banned that practice and, and made the, the uh, workers' claims on the cotton the first to be settled in any kind of uh, a delinquency issue. Uh, and then as an extension to the poor whites who were part of this coalition, there was a debt relief, which didn't affect ex-slaves very much because they didn't have any debt, because they didn't have any... Uh, because uh, they, because they were slaves, the, any debt was held by their owners. So, uh, but they wanted to create this coalition, so they supported debt relief for the, the poor whites. But the big, almost universal fuck up and failure, and you could say you can't blame them really, because we'll talk about how this is de determined by other forces. The, every one of these, except once again with the partial. Uh, exception of South Carolina, every one of these reconstructed southern state governments failed to redistribute land 
in any significant way. And of course, South Carolina, they were able to do it because, once again, black political power was most concentrated. So there was no confiscation of land from uh, rebels, which honestly would have had to have been the purview of the uh, federal government anyway. So in, there was some efforts to sell land, uh, but once again, you don't have any debt if you're an ex-slave, but that means you don't have any assets either. And that includes the bare capital need necessary to improve a piece of land, because all these uh, Homestead Act uh, things stipulate that the land must be improved which means you have to have the capital assets necessary to improve land. The hoe, the hammer, the, uh, the tools, the literal tools, in order to do it. Uh, and if they're planting crops, they need the seed and things like that. They need the fodder. And former slaves didn't have this. And this required this, this dilemma where you have this land and there's, and it's not a very, it's a sparsely settled part of the world. So even absent massive land confiscation, there was land to be given, but it could not be uh, sold because they just, they had had their labor power taken from them completely for their entire lives. In order to overcome this conflict, the, this contradiction, whereas where they needed to redistribute land, but they could only do it through a mechanism of commerce that former slaves could not enter into was to transcend the contract notion, was to transcend the presiding ideological structure in the service of justice. Because land, in this turning land into the personification of justice, not the ability to enter into contract, but the actual land that was worked with one's life. And I would say that well, it's hard to imagine that happening given the structure, the ideological strictures, not just about things like uh, property, but about race that bound the people we're talking about here. I think that, uh, that there was room for that notion to kindle, but in the context where land redistribution had in fact been uh, stamped out and reversed uh, instead of being allowed to fru fructate, there simply was not enough pressure on the existing system within these southern states, in Washington, anywhere, to demand that justice. And instead, and, and there was an attempt to do that uh, uh, in the face of uh, uh, the insufficiency of the Reconstruction governments to provide uh, land justice, there were in some and several states, southern, southern, several southern states, labor conventions of ex-slaves coming together to try to uh, agree upon a, a laborer's, uh, a black laborer's uh, agenda for the governments that they were supporting. And they wanted, uh, and this was a, a political expression of that cry for justice. It's the closest thing we have, uh, or they had to, that they could articulate. And what they articulated was minimum, minimum dignified wage for agricultural labor and land redistribution. And in the face of that, the uh, Reconstruction governments, which, as I said, are professionalized, are pulled away from the grassroots of, of former slave uh, uh, voters who get them in there, uh, are, are kind of captured in these webs of patronage and uh, corruption and the need for Yankee money, let's not undermine that, uh, couldn't give land. They didn't feel they could, but they didn't want to. And what they did instead was they said, look, how about instead of... A, uh, addressing this injustice, we just, everybody gets rich. And that is the American, uh, has been the universal solvent of America's social crises. Oh no, how do we, how do we uh, transcend the limitations of our system to allow for a remediation of injustice? Uh, what, how much does money will it take to put, make this go away? And real crises explode when there's no money to give away. So, uh, what the Reconstruction governments tried to do to fill the gap was build prosperity the same way that the North was in the absence of a civil war to drive economic activity, uh, railroad investment. Uh, this, after the Civil War, 
the Civil War created this massive increase in the government's manu uh, productive capacity and its money supply and its economy. Without a war, uh, that energy had to go somewhere. And because it's a capitalist system dominated by capitalist interests, it went to subsidizing railroad construction, creating an infrastructure, domestic infrastructure of railroad track, not through direct investment, but through subsidy of the private sector. And it was happening all through the West, and it was also in the South. It was supposed to be the engine of prosperity that would obviate all these thorny social questions. What to do about black equality? Uh, what to do about the lack of, uh, of, of black economic opportunity? Build some railroads. That'll solve all the problems. This will stimulate commerce. It'll bring in northern capital, create economic activity. It didn't do any of that. But what it did do was make some of the speculators very rich and uh, also a number of the crooked politicians very, very rich. Uh, and it, what, it created internal uh, networks of commerce that pulled power, economic power and concentration, away from the port cities, which in the antebellum period were the only real concentrations of economic activity in the South because... Uh, because the, plant, the uh, southern plantation system involved getting uh, product not through internal markets, like through canals and through railroads, but by taking it, putting it in the water, getting it out to the ocean, and then sending it to New York or to London. Uh, so this is the so all the economic activity was in these port cities. Now the railroad manufacturing is creating internal cities. is is creating a boom in towns. And, and, uh, and banks and merchant sec nodes within the South and taking power away from the uh, ports. Uh, and in so doing, uh, we see resolved one of the fundamental uh, tensions within Southern society that had existed since the revolution. And that is that you had uh, a ruling planter class in the South, right? The big landowners, the, who were the unchallenged political powers in the South, uh, at least in the deep, uh, the, 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 the places with uh, uh, very extensive plantation agriculture. And then you had underneath them in the cities, this much smaller, less powerful, but more economically, dy uh, uh, more dynamic group of merchants and, and bourgeois, emerging bourgeois, who, uh, who struggled for influence in state government sort of underneath the, 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 the boot of this ruling landed elite. The Civil War breaks open and overthrows the landed aristocracy, not completely dispossessing them, but based, knocking them off of their political perch. And what happens, thanks to these Reconstruction governments, thanks to the uh, direct investment in these real estate uh, railroad speculation uh, company, or these rail, this railroad speculation and the creation of these merchant nodes is a situation where the big landowners start uh, buying shops, start becoming bankers, start in, indulging in merchant capitalism, and these, and, and uh, sort of step down from the plantation veranda to do so. Meanwhile, amongst the grasping class of city uh, folk, some of the more uh, successful merchants start buying land. And this movement resolves this tension and creates this synthesis that is the new landowning merchant ruling class that ends up dominating the South by the turn of the century. This becomes the leader, this, these become the Bourbon Democrats who rule over a sort of a restive population of totally sub subject and deep uh, uh, and politically uh, disempowered black population and a, uh, a economically dominated and ideologically mystified uh, poor white population. But everywhere that this, these new nodes of uh, commerce emerge, they uproot all the existing structures uh, and in the upcountry, 
where small white uh, yeoman farm holding and subsistence agriculture was, was the way of life, uh, the coming of the railroads uh, pulls people away from that and towards wage labor and towards wage la uh, and towards dispossession, a, a lack of that freedom we were talking about. And the way that the states were doing this is by buying railroad stock, gifting land to railroads, guaranteeing loans, creating a business-friendly environment, all, which all undermined the support for Republican governments by poor people of both races. Uh, and undermining, more than anything, support among poor whites who saw Reconstruction come in, and the main thing that it brought about was higher taxes and uh, that they had to start working instead of living on their farm and living subsistence lifestyle that, in their minds, was... Uh, was necessary for freedom. Uh, meanwhile, the whites who stayed most loyal to the Republican Party were up in the mountains, where not only had they fought the hardest for the Union during the war, they were mostly untouched by modernization and didn't lose their traditional uh, uh, autonomy. So, uh, and the main thing that the, the main counterproductive result of all this uh, railroad investment is that it fucking drains the public coffers for all of these new things that they're supposed to be doing, uh, all the education they're supposed to be creating, these infrastructures they're building. Uh, and money has to money comes away from that, and and that undermines the efficacy of these institutions that are being built by the Republican governments. Uh, and the whole time, this is failing to draw in any northern investment. Because the South is still politically restive, there's no real certainty that uh, Reconstruction governments won't be overthrown. And so Northern Capital was much happier to invest in what seems to be more stable political situations in the West. Uh, and so most of this capital has to be raised uh, uh, locally through, uh, uh, through taxes uh, and through... Uh, low, most more than anything through crop loaning. Uh, and then another just poisonous development caused by the railroad uh, is that it's the thing in the South, as much as it was in the North, that created the uh, atmosphere of, of absolutely pandemic corruption that allowed these railroad interests to essentially buy the government with the government's own money. That's the insane thing. These people all bought all this stuff with government debt and government-backed greenbacks that had been used to win the war, and they had co collected them in buckets over the course of the war and were now using them to pay off these politicians, who, especially in the South, were very uh, cheap because their only livelihood was uh, politics. And besides mere bri uh, brazen bribery, there was insider dealing, where you would give someone uh, stock or uh, give them a heads up on a uh, investment opportunity. And all of these things created these networks of patronage that now came outside of government and involved the private sector in the form of these railroad combinations. And, uh, and the whole time the railroads are also ingratiating themselves to the poor, the free uh, black community by uh, sponsoring education and missionary work and offering wage labor away from the plantation, which was something that was very appealing to a lot of, uh, especially young, young men who didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to work on the, the plantation because it had these, uh, it had the feel of slavery to it. And all, and, and the failure here, the, mis the, 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 the botching here, uh, the, the, uh, the mistaken uh, effort to invest in the paltry sums that, that these states had in railroads uh, is a consequence more than anything of the lack of capital that existed in the South. There was no money. The, 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 the economy had been undermined and destroyed. Uh, the 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 uh, even the money supply was shrinking because obviously all the Confederate money immediately was worthless. But even greenbacks were being with restricted in circulation over the course of this period 
because they're trying to move to a gold standard because of the reactionary agenda of the, uh, of the capitalist class. And the only way that you could have accommodated the political aspirations of the freed, the freed blacks and the political and social aspirations of the uh, poor whites sufficient to create an enduring political uh, coalition that could have held power in the face of the planter class and rulers would have been a mass transition of capital to the South, an, an internal Marshall Plan. Uh, and this didn't happen because, once again, there was no power to seek it. The power at the top of the federal government was held by uh, Republicans who were in, invested literally in uh, a hard money economy uh, that made necessary capital redistribution within the country impossible. Uh, and so what happens is uh, debt comes to be the new instrument of coercion uh, to replacing the old planter or the old uh, labor regimes on the plantation. Uh, and it ensnares whites too. Uh, the collection of cotton goes from something that was almost entirely carried out by black uh, slaves in the uh, pre-war period to uh, something that 40% of uh, cotton uh, agricultural workers are are white by the turn of the century, uh, and every compelled every chain in this action is compelled by a lack of capital. Uh, it's 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 the debt of the uh, planter who is being loaned uh, the money for his crop uh, that who that is compelling uh, the sharecropper to go into debt to that planter. At every level, there's a compulsion of debt. Uh, and those, and so freed sl former slaves who don't want to go back to do plantation cotton agriculture are by debt drawn back into it. And uh, poor whites who had before the war been able to live independently are now forced into a wage relationship agriculturally. Uh, and this dooms the social project of Reconstruction, because it confirms the white supremacist idea that there is a zero-sum racial contest between black and white, and that anything that benefits one harms the other, because slavery was abolished, blacks were free, and now white people are, poor white people, are less free. They have less control of their ability to sustain themselves. They have to work for wages instead of work on their own land. And this is not because that's true. It's because the interest of capitalism was the presiding, dominating interest shaping Reconstruction. Uh, once again, you have a thing where the social phenomenon of a, a political economic structure is blamed for uh, something that it is only a response to. And so, last thing I want to talk about here is something that's really interesting, and it is the way that the different types of plantation agriculture, the different modes of plantation production, uh, uh, res respond to this new reality, this new marketized, uh, speculation-based, uh, more internally improved Southern and more financial and, and more debt-based uh, uh, agricultural system. So there's three main types of uh, plantation agriculture in the South, determined by geography, determined by where things grow best. In the uh, Louisiana Bayou area, in, in, in the Gulf, uh, you have sugar, uh, also in, in Florida, but may, the concentrated in Louisiana, you have sugar uh, plantations. Now, uh, sugar planting, is requires two things uh, labor specialization because it's a very complicated process so there's a bunch of different jobs to do that require different 
skills to be learned to do them. Uh, and also uh, capital, because in order for sugar production to be profitable, sugar uh, processing has to be done on site, which means that uh, sugar houses where the uh, cane is turned into molasses actually have to be built and maintained on the premises. So in this situation, once the uh, coercive power of uh, slavery is gone and the uh, leverage of the working population is increased in a situation where their specialization gives them leverage, uh, but also where each plantation has already a significant capital value because it's been improved upon, the ruling uh, elite was largely replaced by northern speculators who had the money to uh, fill the gap. They were able to square that problem of a, popula of a labor population that's going to require more money, more wages than zero, uh, and a higher degree of capital uh, uh, investment with capital of their own. Because it's worth it. Because you've got this, this fixed infrastructure that has a dollar value on it. And that means that it's worth the investment. And in that place, uh, uh, former slaves were able to negotiate for, uh, if not anything you would want to call a fair wage, certainly uh, a, a self-sustaining wage. Now, in uh, South Carolina, you have uh, rice hard, uh, cultivation. Rice requires a great degree of labor specialization in the same way that uh, sugar does, but it is capital unintensive. You don't need to have any built-in capacity on a, on a rice plantation. You just pack up the rice and put it on a boat. Now, what that meant was that when the planters were ruined at the end of the war, there was no uh, incentive for anyone to buy the plantations because the uh, value was essentially non-existent. So in these rice areas, the uh, local, uh, the planter elite uh, had to essentially give in to their workforce. And workers were able to dictate, in many cases, uh, completely the terms of their labor, the amount of, prof of its profit they got, in, in, in some cases actually taking over complete control of the uh, plantation itself to the point where the uh, owners were happy to get anything. But also what that meant, so you had this like uh, peasant communism develop here in the rice plantations because there's no... Uh, there's no pressure, there's no capital coming in to uh, reassert a uh, exploitive labor relationship. There's only this poor schmuck hanging on by his fingers, fingernails. Uh, but as a result of that, though, uh, rice production in the South never really catches back up to its pre-war production. There is economic stagnation. There is no accumulation. There's no capital accumulation, which is necessary in order to compete with other modes of production and other geographic areas. And South Carolina really, which was where the rice, uh, which is where the rice was grown, was the most radical reconstruction state in those early years and saw the most uh, successful efforts at ex-slave land ownership cult and uh, cooperative cultivation, but at a low level of productivity. Because why would you want to work that hard? You're just trying to sustain yourself. You're not trying to build a fucking a gold house to live in because you don't have to escape your conscience the way that the fucking uh, slave owners did. You can live simply and happily. Now in the cotton south, we have something. Cotton production is neither labor intensive nor capital intensive. So there's no capital pressure on ownership to sell like there was with uh, labor or uh, like there was in the uh, sugar belt. Uh, and there's no real pressure from uh, workers for much better conditions. So that mean that, meant that for the most part, the cotton planter class got to keep power. 
even though some of them were broke for a while. And hilariously, uh, Alexander Stevens and John B. Uh, Gordon, the vice president of the Confederacy and a Confederate general, had to uh, endorse patent medicines like like Sarah Palin with the tummy tea on Instagram. Very funny. So the, the so in the Cotton Belt, the uh, the planters got to keep control, but they did have to change, obviously, the nature of their relationship with uh, their former slaves uh, because now they had to pay them. They had to compensate them. They were no longer able to directly exploit them on, on the land through direct coercion. So how were they going to do it? How was this relationship going to be managed? Uh, and at first, the uh, slave owners, the ex-slave owners, were happy to use wages, happy to pay in wages, uh, or at least would have preferred to pay in wages. But uh, the former slaves didn't really want wages, they wanted land. And so they, for the most part, pushed for the, to be <clears throat> pushed, ended up pushing their way towards an accommodation that became known as sharecropping, where uh, you would work on a land that was technically owned by uh, the planter who would loan you uh, seed and uh, capital at the beginning of a growing season, sell it at the end and give you a portion. Uh, now, this was not something that I think that a lot of slaves would have preferred uh, if they'd been able to pick anything, but in a context where their political power was very attenuated, where there was a failure to really pursue these interests politically, uh, an inability to pursue them politically, uh, sharecropping became the closest, and in the absence of land redistribution, sharecropping became the closest thing to land ownership that... Uh, ex-slaves could access, even though it meant going into debt. And what you ended up having was not the end of servitude, really, but the replacement of the coercive mechanism of servitude being direct exploitation in the form of an overseer and a whip and a, and a bot, lack of bodily autonomy to uh, a, a compulsion through debt. Now, if you have been a slave, that difference is substantial and worth having and worth pushing for, especially since in these days, the final contours of what that was going to look like were not sure, were not determined, and no one knew for sure. By the, obviously, by 1900, sharecropping becomes a brutal exploitative machinery that annihilates any upward mobility among former slaves. But that was after the redemption, after the reaction of, and the end of Reconstruction, which of course was not anything that anyone could have predicted would have happened and, or, or could have assumed was going to happen when they were fighting just to be able to live on some land and, and, uh, and be independent and live not under the gaze of an overseer from the, by some guy on a veranda, but to, to be in your own land, on your own, even if you don't own it, uh, your own patch with your own home. That was a... Uh, that was a step up, uh, and it was a negotiated change in the condition of servitude, basically. But it was not the abolition of the state of servitude itself. Uh, and the, fail the, the failure to advance beyond that, uh, that plateau was caused by the failure of uh, durable black political power to be articulated in the South. And that all comes down to uh, the failure to redistribute land because absent land redistribution, uh, there was no, there could be no uh, uh, even contest, which is what the North thought they were doing. They thought, we're going to fight to give the former slaves a fair shot a, on a playing field. Even absent racial discrimination, which of course cannot be absented, that wouldn't have happened because... People were coming into this race literally without a sustenance, which is the only, absent a, a labor movement, sustenance is the only real leverage you have against the wage relationship and the ability to assert your authority within it. Or that or political power, and of course one flows from the other. And without political power and the ability to, to go to the land, uh, you will be cheated. You will be denied any kind of fair compensation, so that even if 
capitalism work the way that it's boosters and the way that these people supporting the, uh, the, the Whig dream that was being imposed by the liberal Republicans, even if you believed it, it could work. Under those conditions, by definition, it could not work. And the only thing that could have broken that was, uh, was land redistribution, which, required, which would never have happened absent class power, which uh, did not coalesce. Uh, and I think that the interesting thing about this period is the degree of fluidity within these systems, how that, uh, the, the process from one level of exploitation to another could have moved farther, could have been more dramatic, the arrangement between capital and labor could have settled differently. And I think uh, the entrenchment of, of land-based black political power in the South could have been a check on this sort of gall gallop towards total corporate subsumption of the political uh, and economic system that happened during this period in, in the North. So next week, we will talk about chapters 9 and 10. And then there's only two more after that. So we got, in two weeks, we'll be done with this bad boy. Uh, I've, I've had a very good time talking about it. I think it's really interesting. Uh, and it's helped me clarify a lot of my thinking about American history, which is good because I've got another pro couple projects I'm working on that are going to try to consolidate this information uh, into something of like a, you know, a, a big, a, a contours of American history type deal. William Appleman Williams type stuff. Uh, somebody said that we might want to do stuff about the German Revolution in 1918, and I think that's a good idea. If I can find a good one volume on that, I might do that at some point in the future. Oh yeah, uh, also, damn, my grandma could make banana pudding. Or what was it? What did, what did Biden say about rice pudding? How is Aunt Gertie, how is Aunt Gertie made rice pudding? I think that he might, if they let him off the leash enough, it might get funny. He might end up being uh, up there with Trump for funny president. So let's hope so. God, my dr God, my dad could eat eat rice pudding. Oh right, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Friday, I'm going to game with Chris. We're going to play Anno 1800. Does anyone know that game? Uh, so we're going to try to build some sort of 19th century age of steam empire. I think that's how it works. So we'll have some fun. We'll talk about my favorite uh, century where all of the uh, old gods died and were, were uh, replaced by new horrifying uh, mechanical demons. Hopefully we'll fix the choppiness, and, uh, but it's also like a map game, so it'll be less disorienting anyway.
I'm just staring at chat for five minutes. That's dumb. I feel like a weirdo. We'll cut this off. All right, folks. Talk to you soon.